construct of the 70 project at the Ukrainian front lines, uh, I think is, is obvious to all of us and looms large over this discussion. So I'm thrilled to have this panel with us. For those of you who haven't yet met them outside uh, and those of us joining us online, I will introduce them to you. I will do it in alphabetical order uh, as opposed to in order to uh, how they're sitting to me. So that means that we start with Dr. Josef Brame, uh, who was for a short time a colleague of mine at the German Council on Foreign Relations, is one of Germany's, I think, most well-known transatlantic experts. Uh, and has just published a book, which I have taken the liberty of translating, and you're going to tell us exactly how you want the English title to be going forward. But he's also, of course, General Secretary of the German Trilateral Commission. His latest book is Transatlantic Illusion, The New World Order and How We Can Retain Our Role in It. Did I do it justice, you think? Okay, good. All right, fantastic. Next to him is Mattia Nellis, who uh, has filled uh, in our panel this evening. He uh, heads the office of Robin Wagner, a German a Green uh, member of the Bundestag, but he's also the co-creator of a, an independent public affairs office that looks at German-Ukrainian relations in particular. Irina Stavchuk is the Ukraine manager at the European Climate Foundation, because one of the issues we want to talk about today is how Ukraine succeeds in its rebuilding uh, and how, how we make Ukraine succeed uh, in leapfrogging uh, into a new future. Um, so she has established there uh, a, an office or runs an initiative uh, in response to the Russian U invasion of Ukraine to mainstream green and climate proof solutions in the post -re post recovery, a post war recovery of the country. And of course, sitting directly to my right, uh, no stranger to many of you is Kurt Volker, the former U.S. ambassador to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, special envoy on Ukraine until 2019. Uh, Kurt has uh, a very distinguished diplomatic career, serving both Democratic and uh, uh, Republican presidents, but of course was also founding executive director of the McCain Institute. So we're particularly pleased, I'm particularly pleased to have this constellation of experts with me. Kurt, I want to start with you. We, we We're just coming off of three days of very intense discussions at, at GlobeSec, uh, where Kurt is on the advisory board. Um, and you really have seen, in speaking of the ideas of geopolitical order, uh, in particular in relation to Ukraine, an entire evolution and have been deeply enmeshed in uh, thinking about Ukraine's uh, future role in global order, but of course the main questions it is asking us, asking of us now. And we've just witnessed a state visit uh, of a French president to the United States uh, who made a couple of interesting pronouncements, shall we say, on how he envisages, envisages European order going forward. And the German chancellor just published a piece today, not a couple hours ago in Foreign Affairs, uh, where he also extemporates on this idea of Russian role in European order. So as someone who's observed this so closely, uh, what of European order? And can we, is this the right time to be thinking about the future of European order yet when the battlefield is what it is? Well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. And let me first address your question and then I wanna take it into a broader context. But uh, Vladimir Putin is antithetical to the idea of European order. <laughs> I haven't read the chancellor's article. I did see President Macron's interview. Uh, this is, in my view, way off base, way off base. Uh, Vladimir Putin has a fascist and an imperial policy of denying the right of Ukraine to exist as a country, denying the existence of Ukrainians as a people and a national identity. He has called them confused Russians. Uh, he blames them, uh, blames their sense of national identity on brainwashing in the West. And he has compared himself in public more than once to uh, the great czars, Peter the Great or Catherine the Great, because he is accumulating Russian lands and lands that rightfully belong to Russia. Um, there is no, th there's nothing in that, whether it is the authoritarianism at home, the denial of human rights, the cynical and barbarous attacks on civilians, the war crimes committed in some of the most heinous ways. There's none of that that is consistent with the idea of freedom, democracy, peace, or security in Europe, period. 
So uh, I was pleased to see some of the responses to President Macron's interview, uh, including from uh, the Baltic states and including some commentators, that instead of talking about what security guarantees Russia may need, we should be demanding from Russia security guarantees about Europe, because he's the one who is violating all of the rules and the norms and the and the standards and what it means to be Europe. So that's that's my response to your question. I would like to say a couple other things, but I don't want to destroy your money. No, 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 no. It's not it's not in any way destroyed. But but maybe let's 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 think about let's have everybody weigh in on this idea of is now a is now the time to think about what glo what global order that's our question but i'm i'm going to stay with european order should look like or what would all three of you need to see first before we can contemplate those questions in earnestness and honesty joseph i'll go to you next i think it's not in our hands to determine whether there should be a diplomatic solution or not it's america ukraine wouldn't be there despite all the bravery we have seen without American help. And if America decides there is more important business in Asia, look at Taiwan and China, then the days are numbered and we have to take care of the wild bear. Uh, that's one thing. And we are two years away, maybe from another political meltdown in the United States of America. That's why I call my book, The Transatlantic Illusion. So we have two important factors that even predate Trump the erosion of American democracy, some even fear a total decay. Those are not lunatics. I mean, they advise the CIA and others uh, about uh, violence uh, in other parts of the world, and they warn now uh, we may be close to a civil war in the United States of America. And what Pax America would mean for us if that happens, or if Trump could come back, and you can tell us a little bit more about that, if Trump is back, how much NATO is, is of value for us? I mean, that alone is something we should deeply consider. And another factor that has been there is that America has been drifting towards Asia, and that continues. Uh, so America will at some day tell Zelensky and his uh, friends, and they're already doing it through the media, listen, you know, you, you should be better thinking about your options now. Now is a good timing. But it's not for us at this point. What we can do is wake up. We are hopefully awake, hell awake. Now we have to take care of our own responsibility. We have to think about deterrence. We have to think about nuclear deterrence, mm. even without America, if Trump should come back and all those things. Those things, uh, I, I think. Uh, and the other thing is we are now living in a, a geoeconomic world. Well, there isn't any more free trade and stuff. So the economy is now a weapon. So while we are absorbed uh, with Russia and Ukraine for good reasons, there is a bigger play going on. So the world powers, and I mean America and China, go at each other. And when elephants make love or worse, go to war, the grass tends to suffer. And, and uh, w where the grass is, I, I think you all... Have, have have an imagination uh, how much we can suffer if they go it go we'll, about it. We'll talk about how we might think conceptualize of European power, and you've just sort of made you've made your stake uh, where you see European power vis-a-vis -vis China and the United States, but also what European leaders should be thinking about now in sort of our second round. Rena, while your focus is on green and 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 technolo technological sustainable transition in Ukraine, you're Ukrainian, and so you experience and think about your family members, your friends every single day. I'm sure you're in touch with them. When you listen to Joseph, Joseph say, "Look, it's up to the United States to decide what order around Ukraine looks like," what does that do to you, and how do you think about that? And it's very difficult in general to overcome, you know, all this crisis that had started that we as Ukrainians could never even believe. So when all these discussions were before the war, like a lot of people could not really believe that Russia would come with weapons and with tanks. And um, like all these years, all these days, like with every day, we don't know what to expect for like, and like for the whole, every Ukrainian, this war is kind of we all on this war so everybody is doing whatever they can 
And uh, on one side, we are thankful to all the global society and all the partners for the solidarity and for the support which has been happening to Ukraine. Without that, it would be very difficult for us to fight. But, um, you know, like we really expect the world and Europe and other countries to kind of support it till the end, because it's not only our fight, but that's actually, you know, the whole Europe, which is at risk. And what we observe that Russia, like after uh, annexing territories, like they um, conduct horrible things to local people, but what they also do, they mobilize local men to go with kind of, you know, for another battlefield. And that's the plan. That's probably what the plan was. Okay, we grab Ukraine and then, you know, we can do whatever we want. That's what they do with eastern part of Ukraine. They are now fighting with us, but that's also happening on other occupied territories. So it's kind of the overall battlefield. And uh, yeah, we just cannot allow Russia not to lose in this war. But who should have the leading voice in terms of who who decides and who conceptualizes how this war, quote unquote, continues, how it ends, how long it will be, what levers are to be leaned into rather? Um, I mean, Joseph put a pretty provocative piece on the table here. Uh, the, de the degree to which discussions are, we know that discussions are going on in terms of, I mean, we've seen the debate internal to the United States uh, between the NSC and senior leaders of the DOD. But I mean, those discussions are clearly happening at the heart of Ukrainian government as well. Who decides? The Ukrainians, the Americans, who decides? So Ukraine should go kind of from its heart, from its feeling, from its people, and then in coordination with partners, like what is the best strategy? So of course, we want this war to end, but when we see that their plan is just to destroy us, like there is no sense of having any kind of negotiations with them. And for us also, as Ukraine, you know, we now reconsider the whole history and relationships. And like for so many years, there were so many betrayals from Russia on our side. So like when all this is so clear and visible, like we don't want to do anything and we don't want to have anything with them, which is kind of um, puts us in a position of expecting them to be nice and understandable in the future or I don't know. Matia, we've heard two clear voices now on how Russia can't be part of a post war European peace order. We've heard a hard stake made that Europeans need to, uh, quote unquote, get ready because the United States might pivot and turn away at any moment. According to Joseph, what's your what's your read on the current situation, both the close focus on Ukraine and the immediate surround as it relates to the big powers? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I apologize for my rather informal appearance. Uh, I was filling in very short notice and my suits got stuck at last night's Bay Air Airport. So that I'll try to compensate with rather sharp insights. So, um, yeah, um, I want to say first, I wouldn't underestimate the Ukrainians' ability to, to influence also our decision making. So it's not that I'm trying to say that the a tail can wag the dog entirely, but the moment uh, the U.S. really heavily leans on Ukraine, I, I think you will have a couple of um, 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 big news stories, um, some Ukrainian leaks um, putting pressure on the uh, on the American government. So I wouldn't entirely uh, say the Ukrainians are powerless, um, and of course they should have the major say in this, and and they they will ultimately decide for how long they are willing and able to fight. So this is my first point, and the second point is the. Um, coming to the European order, there's already a shift taking place, which is interesting from a German perspective, a shift away from a fr Franco-German dominated EU towards a more um, northern and central Eastern European uh, center of gravity. And Scholz understands that, I would say. So, that, But looking at the future European order, I think the, the Scandinavian and the, the Baltic uh, Eastern uh, Europeans will have a much larger say. And uh, now uh, there, there is a mindset uh, that Russia has to be brought in from the cold. And this is kind of, we shouldn't humiliate them. This is the Macron point of view. And for Ukrainians, and I've been, I'm also married to Ukraine. I've been working in Ukraine, working on Ukraine for the past years. This is um, enraging to say the least, mm. to say that uh, it's um, speaking about security guarantees for, for Russia at a point when Ukraine is fighting for its survival is, is difficult to bear. But we understand that, uh, where, at least we have to understand where it is coming from, that we already, thinking about a new European security order where Russia will eventually 
democratize and will be part of again. But for me, the point how we get there is the uh, decisive defeat of Russia in Ukraine on the battlefield with the negotiated outcome afterwards. But I think before we haven't figured out the first part, the discussion about the second part is rather theoretical. Of course, Russia will play a role. And there, there can be guarantees. But first of all, foremost, these guarantees have to be for Ukraine. And last point, today is the anniversary of the Budapest Memorandum, for those who remember. And Russia uh, honored the, that by lobbying another 70 missiles on civilian and Ukrainian infrastructure. So that is another reminder of how Russia takes any security assurances. So for Ukrainians, uh, they will have to rely first and foremost on themselves and on their conventional deterrence. So a major investment into Ukrainian armed forces will continue for years to come. Kurt, we were when we were uh, gathered this weekend with leaders and former leaders of Central and Eastern Europe and uh, some very senior experts uh, who observe very clearly what's happening on the on the battlefield. I think they would have disagreed strongly with this idea that the United States is who decides what ends up happening in this conflict. And I think we heard it very voiced very clearly that this this war ends when, quote unquote, Ukraine has won and territories are liberated, including Crimea. Um, reinterpret what you've just heard. Sure, <laughs> happy to. Um, and, and I'll make several comments related to that. Uh, first off, um, you alluded to it and it was part of um, Thomas's last answer here. The, um, there's a difference between the Biden administration, particularly the White House, and the rest of the government and the Congress. And so if the Biden administration were to be seen publicly pushing Ukraine into negotiations to give up territory in exchange for Russia promising to stop killing, they would come under intense domestic criticism in the United States uh, from the leaks <laughs> from the Pentagon, leaks from the State Department, from members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, there is tremendous unanimity in the mainstream political class, Republican, Democrat, House and Senate, professionals in the administration and support for Ukraine and push back on Russia. The Biden administration is kind of the outlier or the Biden White House is kind of the outlier where they would really rather focus on China and they would really like to see the Ukraine question settled somehow. And you have people like the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, like Bill Burns, the head of the CIA, uh, that have ingrained in them this idea, we have to live with Russia somehow. The same etchings, the same being ingrained that you see in many German and French uh, politicians as, as well. Uh, you can't imagine that there's somehow a defeat for Russia in this. Everybody else, I think, sees it in a very different prism. And that prism is that and this answers your question of who decides. That prism is that the Ukrainians are fighting for us. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainians are standing up for their freedom, for their democracy, for their identity as a people, and the fact that they are a European nation. And everybody among the rest of us sees that and depends on that. And that gets to a point of who decides then is, it has to be all of us together because we're all in the same fight. It's true. Ukraine would not be surviving today without the provision of the military support that the United States has given over the last nine months. And I would criticize this for saying it wasn't enough, it wasn't fast enough, it was, it, we're still placing unnecessary limits, but the fact is we did do what we did and Ukraine survives as a result. For Ukraine to continue, they continue to need military support from the US and from others and this, we keep arguing over this. We keep saying, lift the, lift the uh, limitations on the range of the artillery shells. Why only 80 kilometers? Why not 100? Why not 300 kilometers? Lift the ban on armor. Why not tanks from the United States? Why not tanks from Germany? And why not a consortium of countries? Why not aircraft? They fly aircraft anyway. They just need more. And these kind of limits are, are infuriating you know, to the Ukrainians. And frankly, we don't have a good answer as to why. It's just this innate sense in the Biden White House that is shared elsewhere that, well, we don't want to provoke Putin. And to my mind, that this is the wrong fear. The fear is that Putinism, Putinism survives. 
because that is the same sort of fascism and uh, imperialism that destroyed the whole world 70 years ago. And we, we can't allow that ideology to continue. Um, so we're all in this. Now, I want to comment on two other things. Uh, one of them is the, the broader point about the significance of this is that the future of Europe, part of the question of this panel, is being decided on the front lines of Ukraine now. This is a point that one of our German friends made at the dinner the other night. But how Europe comes out in terms of um, an identity of a European Union that is either open, inclusive, prospering, that sees that Ukraine is an asset that brings resources, that brings talent, that brings economic growth, that brings energy to Europe. That's one Europe. And on the other hand, a Europe where Ukraine is defeated, where Putin is still around, and Europe is having to gird itself against further imperialist and fascist attacks against the idea of Europe, uh, that's a very different Europe. So that's how big this is, is that the future of Europe is really being decided through these war, through this war. And then the, the, the final point, I promise, is that you mentioned China, and I mentioned China once as well. Uh, China is watching. That's the point we need to take away. China is not supporting Russia. They're not giving them military equipment. They're not evading the sanctions. But they are also watching how Ukraine performs and how the West performs. They would love to see the West disunited. They would love to see a failure. They would love to see Ukraine weak um, and Putin to prevail in a way. That would be that would tell them that their efforts to turn around or up, up, upend the global political and economic order can be successful. If they see Ukraine winning, Russia weakening itself, and the West strengthened and united as a result, that tells them that upending the global political and economic order is not going to be so easy. Exactly. Um, Mattia, I want to go to you on that precise issue, because we've just addressed the macro issues uh, of the European divisions, which are major, frankly, um, specifically looking at Europe's role, Europe's power, its structure. Um, but at the beginning of the war, certainly, and we had a discussion this morning, uh, too, internally, uh, particularly the commission, the European institutions, um, you know, you have a commission president who set out to have a geopolitical commission and then didn't quite know what that meant. And then quickly came this crisis. And I will never forget this at the Munich Security Conference when my good friend Natalie Tachi was asking uh, the effectively the European foreign minister, Minister Borrell and uh, the French minister of defense, you know, we have all these instruments where are they? You know, we're, we're possibly heading into a major crisis. And they said, oh, they're not ready yet. And when we, practically, more or less, within 10 days, you had a European peace facility, which was uh, interestingly named for what it then actually did, which is to provide mutual, mutually sourced arms to Ukraine. Uh, but you had a number of sort of European policy levers that actually did work, potentially surprising to all of us European voters. And at the same time, the, the background music is as, as, as Kurt and Joseph and you have described, which there are macro debates uh, on, on the future of, of the continent. So given that you work within the heart of parliament and given that you've been so engaged in this, how do you see this, this playing out, these, these sort of this layer cake of, of European debates? Yeah, this is the first week in parliament, I have to say this. So, um, but I want to say, um, the Commission is not the problem. The European institutions are actually leading uh, the the response to this uh, Russian war. So they are really, um, to an extent, where member states and uh, told me in, um, that they were not shocked, but they were not uh, not quite um, okay with the way the European leading uh, Commission, especially von der Leyen, is is leading ahead without having a majority. In particular, on the membership question of Ukraine. She went ahead and embraced it before there was even a majority in the council um, um, or among the member states as a whole. So I would say the commission is exemplary from Ukraine's perspective, and we have more problem of a consensus within the uh, member states. And this is where we get to, to, to Germany. Germany's response is also to this war has been exemplary to an extent. So Germany, if you, if you had asked me uh, about a year ago, would Germany send weapons in response to a potential escalation of the war in Ukraine, I would have said, unfortunately, no. 
I was in Kiev with uh, Robert Habeck uh, when he in Dnipro actually said we should deliver defensive weapons to Ukraine, and that caused, I, I hate to say, it, a rather shitstorm in Germany because he was criticized. Why would we even consider sending defensive weapons to Ukraine? So here we are. We have come a long way. So my point is, Germany is changing. The Zeitenwende is also about a mental shift, but Germans take a little bit too, uh, too long to change. So the reality is changing faster than we should. So Germany's um, military assistance, for example, second part, is better than its reputation. So I've just finished a study before joining parliament on the German-Ukrainian relations, where we come to the conclusions after a, a, a series of in-depth interviews with decision makers in Kiev and Berlin, that the, uh, the, the quality of the German military assistance is much better than the reputation. So we've come a long way from delivering nothing, anti-tank mines, javelins, to now Gepards, which are basically uh, or a panzer bits, which are at the heart of the Ukrainian counter counteroffensive in the east. So this is very important to say. We've come a long way, a lot to grow, especially on the tanks and other equipment that we are withholding. But especially in the winter now, vital, vital to Ukraine's continued, continued, uh, yeah, successes. Go ahead. So go ahead. No, I, would, I, I was just finishing this. Um, Germany is responding, and the European Sky Shield Initiative is another example where uh, Charles is trying to respond to this new reality. And we can say, okay, we don't really know what this is all about. There is no Poland in it, no France in it, but still it's an attempt to lead. So I'm giving him a little bit of a credit to say, let's see how this is panning out. And of the on the downside, last point, of the 100 billion Sondervermögen, the special fund that Germany adopted, zero cents have been spent. So um, my, my, the main point here is that Germany has not arrived in this new reality. We're still in a mindset of peace, uh, peace mode, in a peace mode. And we're changing too, too, too slowly. So we are only about to adopt the, the purchase of F-35, whereas other countries have already purchased even ammunition from German manufacturers. And now that the Bundeswehr is coming, they say, sorry, get in line. So we are too slow to wake up to this new reality, unfortunately. But we are changing. Well, this is, I think, a perfect segue. And I know, Joseph, you've, you're not only are you an expert on transatlantic affairs, but you're also an energy policy expert. So I think this is where we can put bring a nice bridge together because of course the main wedge that drove straight through the heart of Europe was the questions around oil first and then the questions around gas and the fact that it took so long to figure out what the floor price on the gas questions would be is I think illustrative of what everything that Mattia was telling us um, but also shows that you know in some regards Europe is having a hard time holding itself together on these issues for some of the sort of macro questions that were just raised, but some of the very granular response questions uh, that just came up. But I wonder what, what your take is on the European cohesion component, but then also Germany's quote unquote leadership uh, question mark apostrophe. Before I come to that, I, I'd like to pick up what, what Kurt uh, said about the US and I think Congress as a, as a driver. I mean, Congress, you have both sides on both ends of the political spectrum. You have inward looking fellows. Uh, and with Kevin McCarthy, I think uh, he should be taken seriously. He said the time of Blankoshek's for Ukraine may be over. And you never know if Trump is again in the race, he may uh, offer another deal to Zelensky, offer me uh, Hunter Biden and, and Biden and, and you get more. So on this one, I would say uh, there could be even impeachment efforts by Republicans against the sitting president on the Ukraine question. And this whole unity uh, that looks like a unity could be soon over in an electoral campaign that has already started. So on this one, it's not probably not only China bashing, but uh, it may be again on this one where Biden is vulnerable, should he decide to run again? If not, different ballgame. But uh, the major point is, yes, weapons, that's US, we maxed out. I didn't know we had that many weapons. I, I served in the German military 30 years ago, and, and we had a saying, we hold the ground until the real military shows up. So our American friends, and we didn't do a good service to our military the last three decades. I mean, uh, we don't have a military. Let's be honest. I mean, this is... Uh, a military is something different. That's America. So, uh, and America does what it does uh, to show strengths to Asian allies. Another Afghanistan disaster was not really welcome. So you you help Ukraine also to signal to South Korea, to Japan, uh, we will be there for you if, if the dragon gilt's wild. So you have to do a little bear taming to, to have friends uh, against the dragon. And India, 
we may talk about later or talk about right now with the oil sanctions, this way we could get it in, is another good example why America is focused on Asia. India had equidistance between China and US, and now thanks to uh, China's aggression, it's more on the US side again. Uh, and uh, America is not pushing India to follow suit on the oil sanctions for two reasons. First, uh, the European theater is less important. The European museum is less important economically than Asia. And you need uh, India to contain China. Quad is the new NATO, if you will. Uh, uh, the second thing is you cannot be too harsh on oil. Gas doesn't matter for, for Russia's income that much as oil. But if you push the sanctions too hard, you may not have regime change in. Moscow, but regime change in Washington. The oil prices spike up. Uh, you have already seen it. Biden had to go to Riyadh, uh, do a nice little fist bump. Uh, another guy who isn't that nice uh, to make up with him. And he showed him the finger as the Washington Post said. So uh, America cannot be too harsh on all sanctions. Otherwise, uh, you would undermine your own regime and would make a good uh, preparation for Trump to come back in the White House. So on this one, I think we should be very realistic. Our American friends, Janet Yellen, told us, don't be too harsh on, 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 on the sanctions because that would push inflation, much more inflation would uh, urge the Fed to put more on the brakes and uh, being more on the brakes could be another financial disaster. So people are uh, already predicting not only an economic crisis, but also a financial crisis in the next year. And if that happens, uh, we don't talk that much about Ukraine, believe me. So there's lots to unpack there on the American domestic side. I have a lot of opinions on that too, but I'm not here to voice any of those. We'll go back to Kurt in a second, but I do, Joseph, I do want to get you to weigh in on Europe before we go to Arena. So my original question going into this round was as you look at European unity on the energy piece, but on all the sort of more geoeconomic issues, uh, what's your projection for the next couple of weeks and months? No, no, I'm looking at you, Joseph. <laughs> There isn't that much unity because it's not demanded by Washington or others. I mean, we already get 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 a bail. I mean, uh, we already get signals. Okay, you don't have to get full sanctions because we in Washington cannot handle it either. So everybody has an understanding. Therefore, our limits aren't tested because the breaking point with oil sanctions is in Washington, not here in Europe. With gas, it would be differently, but the gas income doesn't matter as much as uh, the oil income does for Russia. Therefore, this question uh, is not the most relevant. The most relevant is where's the breaking point in Washington in an election year? Okay, well, that, there's much to unpack there too. Irina, where there's been some remarkable unity by the Europeans, because maybe potentially that's easy, quote unquote, is on the humanitarian and financial aid and thinking about what the coffers need to look like to rebuild Ukraine going forward. And I think of, you know, the reality that plans were in place to rebuild London two years before the war ended and allowed, uh, you know, the Brits to rebuild at the speed that they did. So as you look at now, there's a whole panoply of possible plans out there, but we've already had our first donor series of donor conferences. If you look at this from your specific perspective, but then also, you know, doing a needs assessment uh, that Ukraine currently has, is that lining up? Is that matching up? And is European unity in that sense providing? That's a very difficult and wide question. So I, I try to maybe point out some of the most uh, important issues. So first of all, when the war started and all the preparations for the recovery started in Ukraine, everybody in Ukraine had a feeling that this war will be like for a few weeks, maybe a few months. And then with the war ongoing, there is more and more understanding how difficult it is and how complex the whole issue so like even these energy attacks before October, the overall mood was very much for recovery. But now with all the attacks, we don't know where to put the dots or what we will, what in the end will kind of will we have in Ukraine as it is now. Um, the international conversations are happening and that's very much important. That gives kind of a perspective, but it also a time to answer many, many difficult questions like on the leadership, on the coordination, 
uh, on how to arrange things, on, on finance, where the money would come from, on institutions, which are not only international institutions to implement projects in Ukraine, but a lot has to be done on institutions in Ukraine and how the funds would operate. Um, there are political issues that we observe and um, kind of that uh, civil society in Ukraine is talking a lot about. Uh, one is, of course, European integration that has to be part of it to make sure that we recover based on certain rules and standards and principle. Another one is Ukrainian society expects control of money. We know how uh, corrupt can things be in Ukraine and uh, how vested interests can come in. So Ukrainian society and civil society and a lot of people, they expect international community to help Ukraine to control and to keep things accountable for, but also through this recovery to help to build institutions which will remain afterwards. So transform our funds which operate on the national level and make them based on the good governance principles and really accountable for people, but also plan better and effectively. For me, as a person who used to work in government on climate policy issues, of course, like the green recovery and climate smart recovery are key issues that has to be part of the international criteria, because in Ukraine, there are many, many opportunities. And of course, if you have something destroyed and you plan how to build it, on many calculations, it shows that it's much better to do it with the new technologies. Uh, in some cases, it's more expensive. And, and here, I think like we were trying to find arguments why, for example, if we talk about international program on um, rebuilding kind of new residential buildings which were destroyed, like making them more energy efficient might cost more, like who would pay for it and why? Um, and uh, it's it's very easy to get in the kind of business as usual scenario. Let like we have lack of resources. Let have as much as possible as quickly as possible. And I think what we have to take into account is energy security because that should be part of the kind of economic cost for the future and for resilience. And it has to be calculated together. So if we build the houses, okay, we don't isolate them, but we have certain criteria on windows. And the, another example on that is, uh, for example, um, so we have this crisis in the winter now. So what Ukrainian government is asking, diesel generators. So the whole world is sending generators to Ukraine, but this problem will not end up in two months. So why not to also include kind of solar systems for the critical infrastructure, which would provide um, electricity during the spring and summer, because we will still have the problem that it's also part of the, pro of the project, but which also supports building resilient uh, energy system in Ukraine for the future. So like we have to learn to think together how to address these issues to make sure that like we don't only make quick and in Ukraine, sometimes people don't also realize it. So we have to think about it all together. Um, yeah, I think I stop here. Thank you. So just to give you a roadmap of what we're going to do, we're going to pick up these points, go back to Kurt and Mattia for because Kurt, having been in Ukraine when he was, these anti-corruption efforts were, of course, largely on the mind of both American governments that got very vested in the Ukraine question, not least because for a little while we had a Ukrainian-American finance minister of Ukraine who spearheaded a lot of anti-corruption efforts, and then things became very difficult and gnarly, and we just heard again over the weekend that Ukraine has understood very well that it needs to up its uh, sort of anti-corruption fight to make sure that um, uh, monies that do come in are going to be used, well, purposefully. So we'll go to Kurt Mattia one more time. Then we'll do one more loop on American domestic politics and its impact on Ukraine. So don't worry. Uh, and we'll do one final uh, quick fire piece on European power, and then it's over to you and your questions. So uh, Kurt, you observed Ukraine for a long time, its development toward, you know, uh, via Euromaidan and forward. Um, when you hear Irina's sort of assessment on thinking about the rebuilding piece and thinking about what the domestic climate could be going forward, how do, how do you read this? What's your, what's your assessment? Well, it's a question with so many things to comment on, and I apologize if I try to touch on all of them. Uh, I'll try not to. But first off, 
I went to the Lugano conference. I went to the Berlin conference. I've seen all of these discussions about Ukraine economic recovery. And I can assure you that absolutely nothing is happening. And this is a problem. <laughs> there, is, there is no plan. There is no action. There is nobody in charge. There is no Ukraine recovery coordinator in Washington or in the EU or in Berlin or in Paris or London, the IMF, the World Bank. There is zero. Um, so this is a problem. We need to get organized and think about how to do this. The second thing, one of the reasons for this is an implicit assumption is that we'll do this after the war. When the war is over, then we'll help Ukraine recover. This is wrong. Ukraine cannot afford to wait until after the war. Who knows when after the war will be or what after the war means. But Ukraine needs an economy. It has people. They need jobs. You need a tax base. You need to pay for the military. You need to pay for pensions. You need to pay for health care. So this has to happen now. We need to get the economy going now. Third, there is an assumption. Again, no one says it. It's just an assumption in the way people think that it's going to be aid. We're going to give money to Ukraine. We're going to humanitarian aid or economic aid or budget. We're going to give money to Ukraine. This is a wrong assumption. We, sh we won't and we shouldn't and we won't. <laughs> we should help the Ukrainian economy come back. And that will be using what limited public resources there are in a, in a prudent way to enable the private sector to invest and build a real economy. And this is what will generate jobs. This is what will create a tax base. This is what will make Ukraine sustainable. Government aid, once given, will disappear. Government or public resources, especially if you can seize the Russian assets and use that to provide insurance for investors, risk insurance, use our export credit agencies to provide risk insurance, back that up with, with commercial banks to back up the export credit agencies, all under a sovereign guarantee from Western countries to support our own businesses. That kind of thing will work. And nobody is going to give the money to the Ukrainians. So this question of how corrupt is it and what are they going to do with the money? It's not the way it should work and not the way it's going to work. We're going to use funding that we do control to create programs that will then enable our own, whether it's aid agencies or our own investors, our own businesses, to do what they need to do to invest in Ukraine. Uh, or we'll create a program for demining, and then we'll pay the money to do demining. So, so many different things uh, will happen other than giving the money to Ukraine, but it needs to get going right away. Mattia, when you look at, I mean, Kurt talked about the donor conferences, and it, it's exactly the, I mean, the debate that's been having on the red, on, or that's, that has been going on, grants or loans, sequencing of, what, how do you incentivize private investments? What's your read of this landscape? I've been uh, also at these donor conferences. I would slightly disagree. Yes, we're circling away around ourselves in, in the kind of governance of the recovery while Ukrainians are fighting for their survival militarily and economically. So uh, I would say, again, the European commissioner here is leading ahead by, by saying we need to adopt a uh, macro financial assistance worth 18 billion for the next year to get Ukraine kind of through the next year because they're budget deficit is sky high and without um, uh, even the pledged aid arriving, the inflation is skyrocketing. So the money that we pledged to deliver or to, get to, uh, to send is not coming in time. So that's why we have to, before talking about the, the big, oh, we have to chew gum and uh, walk at the same time, but we have to do both at the same time. We have to focus on Ukraine's immediate survival, which is not guaranteed. And I mean, economically and militarily, and that's why the, the, the grants are very important because Ukraine's um, debt ratio to GDP is around 100% now. So if we're loaning and loaning and loaning, it will be even higher. So that's, a very, that's why loans are important to keep Ukraine afloat. Ukraine is now already spending 50% of its uh, budget for defense spending, about 30% or 12% 12, 12 of its GDP on defense alone. These are sky high figures. So I, I want to say that we have to be laser sharp focused on getting Ukraine throughout 2023 first and plan for the recovery afterwards. So the 
Ukrainians call that fast recovery. And they have, there are many needs assessments out there from World Bank, EU Commission, and the Ukrainian government together, and both on, on the kind of short-term needs and the long, longer-term needs. And if you take the longer-term needs, we're looking at $750 billion dollars what it would cost to rebuild Ukraine. And as Kurt was saying, that's impossible to do by government money alone, but it's also impossible to, to wait for the Russian uh, assets to be frozen and given to Ukraine. So we have to be realistic. Where does the investor's money come from? And there we have some professionals here in the field. I'm told by uh, business people that they, they wouldn't invest a single dime. It doesn't matter what kind of risk insurance you have, as long as Russian rockets might be flying on Kiev. So this is part of the realism that we have to face. Uh, we have to keep the Ukrainian economy afloat while we ensure that these rockets are not flying anymore. Because even the best Iris T SLM systems, the best um, rocket defense, missile air defense systems cannot protect all of Ukraine. They can protect only certain targets. So we have to be laser sharp focused again on the survival and the military short term victory of Ukraine. But nevertheless, the uh, discussion about the uh, way forward is very important for Ukraine. And it also shows, this is my last point, that Putin is uh, trading now money backs for time. He's betting with his mobilization. He bought himself months, maybe a year, in terms of stabilization of his military endeavors. He's betting that we are the weak link in this equation. He's betting on our will in the West to falter. And I look at very much at the economic indicators at, at our aid, and so is Putin. He might have underestimated and misjudged the Ukrainians, but he's still a KGB man after all. So he's sensing weaknesses in, in the West, and we have to prove him wrong. That's my, my main point. We have to keep investing into Ukraine's victory and their recovery. Wow, as Matthias, it's as, as if we um, did a little uh, game of uh, of ha hand the baton because weaknesses in the West. Now we're right back at our internal conversation about the United States. So uh, Joseph put on the table that uh, Kevin McCarthy, in his desire to become speaker in January, uh, is going to potentially let himself be pulled to the extremes in the Republican Party that not only want to look at accountability in terms of the spending uh, on Ukraine. And again, I just want to remind this audience, we've just had, I think, another 38 billion uh, American dollars appropriated for uh, a Ukraine spent on top of the over 50 billion that the United States has already spent in combined financial, military, and humanitarian aid on supporting Ukraine. So those indicators seem to say something different, even if uh, part of the Republican Party wants more accountability. I think accountability is probably fine. But uh, internally, is Kevin McCarthy going to have his agenda so dictated by the extreme parts of the Republican Party that we end up with a such a vice on uh, a Biden administration and a, con a congressional spending uh, that we ultimately see, quote unquote, the bottom drop out? Kurt? We won't see that. And I just have to ask, did I miss some news today? Did we actually approve the $38 billion? Well, I think that, that, that's in the approval pipeline as far okay, as I Yeah, I, I agree with so. you. It's in the pipeline. So uh, let me describe that first. The, as my understanding as of the weekend, the Biden administration um, proposed $38 billion in additional funding for Ukraine. President Biden sat down with the leaders of the House and the Senate in the Oval Office and went over priorities for the remainder of the year. And this is one of them. And this actually suits Kevin McCarthy's interests. He wants this to be approved in the lame duck session while Nancy Pelosi is still the speaker. So he doesn't even have to deal with it. That's easy for him. His motivation is not that he does not support Ukraine. He actually does. His motivation is getting elected speaker by his own caucus. <laughs> and that's where um, he may have 220, 221 seats, who knows. Um, if he has 15 dissenters there, he has a problem. Mm -hmm. Once he is elected speaker, he no longer has a problem because he has a vast majority of Republicans and a vast majority of Democrats who support Ukraine, who support sanctions on Russia and so forth. He will not have a problem with his issue again in, in the next two years. His statement that he made about no blank check was a very constructive statement. And I think people in Europe misunderstand it if they think he means he's threatening aid to Ukraine. What he's doing is protecting aid to Ukraine by giving the far right a safe zone. Say, you go and you demand accountability and transparency and we'll provide the money, but then we'll have hearings and we'll have information. That's very safe because then the aid can keep flowing. Uh, if it were to be against 
aid, that would be a problem. So what he's trying to do is steer that far right of his caucus. And similar, the, the mainstream Democrats have steered their progressive left as well. You saw the letter come out of 30 progressive Democrats urging negotiations. Which they now, withdrew because which they withdrew crazy. only because of the outcry exactly. <laughs> from the Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, the presidential election is different, and Trump is uh, another thing. Uh, even even in the immediate, another evergreen uh, fiscal cliff. You know, the debt ceiling, and uh, I would bet a lot of money Republicans will hold that hostage to cutting expenses over the board. And now I ask you, do you think you will cut your domestic expenses e more easily than foreign expenses or ask your European friends to do a lot more? That was my point. So I think that will be our core competency uh, rebuilt, and this is not done in a year or two. I and mean, we are talking about many years, uh, many dollars, therefore, and euros probably, I would ask for uh, 750 billion not to die as a one-time show, to be greener, to be more digital. So I think we have a good chance now to issue common debt, to have a Ukrainian, Western, uh, whatever, save it fund. So we are now becoming United States of Europe. Thanks to an external threat, the Hamiltonian moment, I remember a former finance minister, now a chancellor, a chancellor, talking about a Hamiltonian moment. So this is a big word, I mean, especially for Americans. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we learned the lesson that America didn't uh, end up as united uh, right after that. You had a civil war, so <laughs> wrong incentives. So I think we have now a chance to really communitize our debt and put it in military baskets, in other baskets, and really take care of our hood. Uh, because even if Trump doesn't come back to the White House, the Biden administration has more important business to do, as you just said. So this will be We're gonna our, that. our neck of the wood, and we have to take care of it. And this will take a few days more than the American attention span for it, Europe it, It's a last. really critical piece because it finally lays out, and I think it's a provocative point to make in front of a German audience, because in our own budget discussions, we've just gone back to the idea that, of course, we're going to have the Schuldenbremse, and the Schuldenbremse will be just fine. So I think it's a very provocative point to make in this discussion. It's a necessary argument to make uh, in the public discussion, and it says something about where European power needs to go, which is how we're going to cap this discussion. But Kurt, I wanted to just make sure that we touched on all the U.S. Mm -hmm. domestic points. Maybe you want to say a word on LNG versus oil. I mean, that's, of course, a, cr a critical piece that the Biden administration is looking very closely at. Take it in any direction, and then we'll do okay. a loop on Europe, and then it's over to you. Well, I think, Joseph, where I would agree with you is that the fight in the U.S. in the Congress is going to be on domestic issues, not on these foreign policy issues. Uh, second, What's going to happen? There are uh, all of you, I'm sure, connoisseurs of deep, deep domestic politics in the U.S. But there will be a fight over the budget, and there will be a fight over the debt ceiling, and the the debate initially is going to be what gets done in December in the lame duck session, versus what gets done when the majority flips to the Republicans beginning in January, and therefore, for how long do you extend the debt ceiling? Uh, for how long do you pass a continuing resolution to carry the government through? Um, unlike Ukraine aid, where McCarthy's incentive is pass this now and forget about it, his incentive on the budget issues is no longer than February. You know, give me give me a two month debt ceiling extension, and then we're going to refight it again because he wants the leverage exactly. And what will they do? They're not going to cut Ukraine aid. They're not going to cut the defense budget. They're going to try to cut the Green New Deal. This is the, the talking point. <laughs> yeah, they're going to cut out the, the subsidies. They're going to block the student loan forgiveness as inherently unfair. Uh, and they're going to go here, after- here. Yeah, Sorry. No, no, I'm with you on that. Editorializing. Yeah, they're, they're going to go after a lot of these domestic things that are both a little bit costly, but- very so very uh, unpopular among segments in the U.S. and that will reinforce the difference 
of having a Republican House rather than a Democratic House. We could have a whole uh, other set of discussions on how this will play out in the fight that we're constantly, is currently having transatlantically, this wedge issue that the Europeans effectively have created for themselves. And again, I'm editorializing on the IRA debate because all of these, if you know American politics, you can foresee uh, some of the things that Kurt Volker has just mapped out and we have mechanisms on which to address diplomatically uh, the issues within the IRA. So, um, but that's a whole separate session here. Um, Mattia, but that it does, Joseph's point I think is, is well taken, which is to what degree, and this this in part brings in the China piece as well. Um, you know, how, you mentioned Robert Habeck, his ministry has just published its own quote unquote China strategy or China look ahead where you have a point being made that they envisage a potential um, military incursion on Taiwan potentially by 2027. And the real question, I think that's behind what Joseph said in terms of European responsibility, and this is the European power round on which we're going to end, uh, is this idea of what happens if a sanctions burden on Europeans is both vis-a-vis -vis Russia and on China? And what does that do to European cohesion, your, the European economies, the model of European economy that is the foundation of, if it so exists, European power? That's a very difficult question. So um, I cannot speak for the uh, BMW car, for the minister. That's very important, even though I work for a Green Party MP. So uh, I can only say that German, Germany is learning some lessons from, the Russia, from, from Russia's war of aggression, which is some companies, and let's face it, made themselves too dependent on the Russian market. This is, they are not representative for the German economic model as such. But uh, we, we see uh, a company from my home state class in the headlines for circumvening and potentially breaking the Russia sanctions. So we're now looking ahead, and I think you're referring to leaks. So the BMW car is now thinking, and the German government is thinking about its China strategy. And we see that we are reflecting what do dependencies make of us? You know, our, the idea was that uh, change or rapprochement through trade would work. And the reality is, no, actually, it worked the other way. We are more... Uh, the autocratic states had more influence on us than we on them, um, I would argue. So with China, it's very difficult, yeah, because the uh, um, the businessman would tell you it's very difficult to decouple. So we just have to, the first step is really to make ourselves aware of dependencies and make them uh, interdependencies or uh, uh, diversify away from them. That's very, very important. But if we just blindly follow the status quo, um, then we're going to fail when there, when there comes attention, maybe not an invasion, but a blockade of Taiwan, then we're going to be in real trouble. And Germany is just slowly awaking to that. And then the last point I want to make is that we could, uh, if, uh, if we want to see a change in Russia, uh, it is through Ukraine. It is potentially through Ukraine. So the only way to now um, uh, to change Russia is through Ukraine, Ukrainian victory and to prepare for a moment X, which is another 1899 moment. So we have to prepare for that for potential collapse of the Russian government or a continuation of its imperial policy. But we have to do it in advanced thinking on that. And I'm afraid we're too slow on that. Joseph, how much how much is happening on European strategy to to achieve something like European power? I mean, you've just mapped out, I think, the ideal of what maybe a German taxpayer, European taxpayer certainly would wish is going on in the halls of government, that you're planning for all contingencies, that you're figuring out how to refinance um, you know, finance European power for the future, uh, that you're thinking about, you know, what happens when all these scenarios uh, potentially occur. Um, what's your wish list? Again, uh, we can learn from the U.S., uh, also from, from mistakes made. Uh, we don't have to have a civil war and wrong incentives, so moral hazard. I don't know how many states went broke and then civil war also was easier because money was scarce. Uh, but there is a difference whether you are indebted in your own currency or not. There will be many parts of the world that will figure out what a strong dollar means for them. So if we indebt ourselves in the euro, we can act as US. We don't have to care whether we will ever, ever pay back that debt. You just print more money. Quantitative easing. And all that. So if we figure that one out, because we pay anyway, it's now the ECB. It's uh, the backdoor financing. And we give money to Italian banks, to other countries' banks, to so Southern Club, as, as they say. And we don't have uh, golden strings attached. U.S. has golden strings attached to their states. 
they, they are not always on the same page as Washington, but if they take money from Washington, there, there are gotta be rules. I mean, there are incentives, so gold strings. Now we are starting with Poland, with Hungary, and we can do more of that. You issue common debt, give money to individual states and say, if you take that money, there we do have a, a, mm -hmm. and that's what we can learn from the United States of America. That's what America did after the, the economic crisis, 29, First World War, Second World War. So states became dependent on Washington because of the golden strings. And that's what we have to do in Europe. Uh, issue common debt, uh, then we can have a lot more debt. Then uh, maybe maybe some some oil producing countries would uh, have, have, have another safe harbor in the Euro. Uh, I think, uh, and then we are talking about a superpower Europe because the strongest uh, power tool of the United States is the dollar. The dollar or a denomination of oil in the dollar. So we are, leaning ourselves off the old stuff, oil, gas, getting into something new. And the question is, uh, what is the new economy be driven by in which currency? Though on the USS Quincy, King even South and Roosevelt made a deal. That was the beginning of the superpower of America, the endless uh, spending money, living on tomorrow. Uh, and Europe would have a, a chance to help the dollar become a leading currency because sometimes I hear from our US friends the dollar is too strong and this and that and you can be helped we so need a strong I, euro we'll have you uh, alongside. With, with one thought um, but Arena I mean we just heard part of that also in terms of about major transitions we know Europe has to undergo major transitions um, you know we've mapped it out in terms of geopolitics uh, Joseph has led us into a transition on the way that it thinks about its own fiscal and financial stability going forward globally. Uh, Irina, Europe has to go, will undergo, has committed to undergoing also a green and energy transition that will then have to lead the transition in Ukraine. That's all going to have to fit together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Um, and so as you're here now, as you think about European power in, in the way that you conceptualize of it, what is it and how is it going to help us move these big questions of transformation forward? No, I think that's the only way for the future development. We have to resolve the climate change issue. We have to implement all those measures that we are thinking about in terms of transformation of economies, of different sectors and of industries. And um, I just hope that, uh, you know, this war would not become the kind of not create situation when we make things slower, but actually make things quicker within Europe and in Ukraine, but also globally. Because like I, I've been coordinating the uh, climate uh, goals in Ukraine update, and we've been looking at the sectors we've been calculating. So for the energy sector, it makes all economic sense, the energy efficiency and moving towards renewables. The question is how to make things happen, how to put all the barriers off it and how to make things run. So yeah, my hope is that it all will happen. Um, how Ukraine and Europe can become stronger together. There are a lot of opportunities in Ukraine in terms of critical raw materials, in terms of hydrogen, many talk about it, but also in terms of renewables. 12.5 have... trillion dollars in terms of rare earth materials in Ukraine's earth. I just wanted that number I find staggering, but it is yeah. a reality. So opportunities are there and we just have to make sure that we can kind of implement it all together. So what you've just heard implicitly from the last three speakers is the degree of transformation I think European societies will have to go through. Uh, we talked over the weekend about the kind of loss and change that that will manifest in our publics, that I think arguably our public sphere is uh, not yet transmitting to European publics, which is the whole question of where does the European and German Wohlstandsmodell go in the future, the loss and change that that causes as a manifest at the heart of our democracies and uh, the attraction of populism. But that, again, is for a different uh, discussion. Kurt, one last thought on European power, and then over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Irina made the point. I'm just going to rephrase it, uh, which is that Ukraine for Europe is an asset, not a liability. That sometimes you need to pay a little bit for an asset, 
but it brings it'll bring the fastest economic growth on the continent for the next five years after 23 is over so 24 onward it has energy resources renewable energy resources it has minerals it has mining it has rare earth minerals it has an incredibly talented population it has one of the best tech sectors in any european country so it is a sophisticated uh, country and an asset for Europe, and Europe will be far stronger and better with Ukraine in it. Well, we always try to end on an optimistic note, at least those on the stage with a blue passport. So Kurt uh, has done it, has done his ask justice. Um, questions from you, the audience, or questions from our Zoom audience. I'm happy to entertain them at this point. Please just raise your hand. I see Jira has, somebody has a microphone in the back. Um, we'll bring the microphone to you. Just introduce yourself briefly so we know who you are. Oh, there are the hands are going up. Fortunately, it's not a blackout. Good evening. Uh, my name is Remik Nowakowski. I'm from... Polish Energy Think Tank Foundation. It's a very interesting discussion and I'm really happy being here to, tonight with you and listening to these different voices and opinions. Um, I just want to make some comments maybe to this discussion and uh, ask one question. So first of all, I think uh, that the best method of uh, overcoming any crisis is learning on our mistakes. And I think we are still at the point we didn't make our lesson as a Europe, because the fact we've, we are now in the middle of the war in this part of Europe didn't come sudden. It started 2014, when Crimea was lost, part of the integral country of Ukraine, what we did as United Europe, European Union, I mean. I love the concept of United Europe. And I think that's the, the most important factor to win with Putin. Because if Europe won't be united, and if we don't find a way how to work together, because if I hear today that Germany have no military forces, or it's US only who will finally made their decisions on oil and so on. It's not only that. We need strong leadership here, here in Europe. We need to take responsibility as all the countries because it's different being in Poland when you think who is next, us, Lithuania, Estonia, and in France to say, let's come back to status quo. We can't lose more money. If we don't find this balance, if we don't listen, ourselves and have strong leadership on the European Union level, we won't win. It will be only time that Putin will win. And that's to me now one of the biggest threat because I can't see now this kind of approach, first of all, to learn on our mistakes. We are doing now as, as, uh, as the think tank, this kind of analysis on geopolit geopolitical impact on the uh, on the gas industry in Europe, and uh, also trying to assess the balances of the gas that will come from US LNG, other uh, part to compensate the gas that will not come from Russia, because it should be clear, let's forget about this forever, probably. But this can be done only if we do it together. There was a great concept of energy solidarity of European Union. Unfortunately, it failed. I hope now it's a time to restore it. And one question to you, uh, what do you think, when really Putin will stop? I mean, can we now say, let's trade peace for status quo? Or shall we be really strong and united, demanding Crimea be back to Ukraine as the main condition for end of the war. Thank you. Well, we'll move that down the line, Kurt, starting with you. I'll answer your final point here. Um, there is no peace with the status quo. 
uh, Russia occupying, killing, torturing, executing Ukrainians is not peace. And he will not be, uh, he will not stop just because he accepts a ceasefire today. That's what we saw in 2014. It will continue the fascist ideology of destroying Ukraine as an identity and the imperial ideology of taking over these territories for Russia because it's Russia's right. So there is no peace with the status quo. Russia must be pushed back in order for there to be peace. Yeah, just quickly to agree. So when Ukraine is fighting back, it's not fighting just the territories. It's mainly fighting back people who are suffering on that territory. And Crimea has to be part of it because like, it's too dangerous for Ukraine to, to stay, like understanding that there can be another attack happening. But also in general, as a principle, like it has to go back and then like it could be decided how to handle internal issues. Putin's mind, but I uh, finished that book before and I was for deterrence, a lot of military and nuclear deterrence, because I was of the opinion this bear doesn't just want to cuddle. So uh, if I if Putin hadn't grabbed another bite, I would be a warmonger these days. Uh, people would attack me. Why do you uh, why are you are for for deterrence, not only American uh, participation, but also with France together if, 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 if Trump could come back. Uh, but again, we also need a diplomatic element. Uh, at the end of the day, every war needs to be dealt with uh, diplomacy. We have to hold our noses and have to deal with the guy. I mean, that's what Richard Haas and others are plainly making clear. And uh, Russia won't go away. I mean, it's just a geographic fact. And I'm afraid this, we are far away from that because he thinks he still has some leverage and tests our weaknesses, economic weaknesses, domestic support. That's a problem with democracies. An autocracy can be on the longer end on this one mm. because, you know, they are used to that. And, 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 and I think here, here in Germany especially, we could be a weak spot. Uh, therefore, I would... Uh, also help uh, Ukraine now human humanitarian. So this isn't just a business thing now investing. I mean, this will cost a lot of money to save many lives. I mean, we are losing many more lives now, uh, right now through this humanitarian crisis uh, than uh, on the battlefield. So this, this is a big issue that costs a lot of money. Therefore, I think we need a united Europe and we need a way to finance that because that's next to our border. And I'm talking about uh, refugee flows yeah. that are not good for this country to be rebuilt and, and, and not good for us because our capacities are over. So it's in our self-interest to really uh, put in a lot of money, more money than the US is doing. I mean, it's a shame that the US is, is, is buying a lot more for our security and, and, and uh, humanitarian aids uh, in our hood than we do. I think we have to wake up uh, as Europeans or we should forget about all that talk about values and, and what, what we have there. And, and We'll see almost the estimation is again, almost 2 million people on the move this winter just because of the blackouts, the rolling blackouts, the infrastructure issues um, uh, going forward. So thank you, Joseph, for pointing that out. Mattia. Yeah, very briefly, much has been said. I just want to re-emphasize that Putin has staked everything, his regime's survival on this war now. He has metaphorically burned all the bridges, all his boats, by annexing the four Ukrainian territories. So there is for him nearly no way back. And the problem we have in the West is, especially in Germany and France, if you look at the polls the, uh, in Germany in September for the first time, you see in the polls uh, the majority of German narrow uh, see a Ukrainian victory as a possibility. 40, now we are at 42% versus 40 so the problem is France and Germany are stuck in this fear of escalation and in the belief that Ukraine cannot win. And I tell you, Ukraine is and will win this war. It's just a matter of the time and the cost. They are determined and they have determined allies in Poland and elsewhere, and they will make this happen. And it's, it's going to cost Putin most likely his regime's survival. And we have to deal with the consequences because what comes after will not be necessarily better. Yeah. So we have to create a conflict order and yeah. think about the peace order afterwards. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Go ahead. You had a question. Hi. 
I'm Christina Venarius, and I'm an anthropologist working on the different cultural views of towards the multipolar world order. And my question is bringing China back in. Um, you all kind of mentioned it briefly um, that we have to deal with China. And what I got from various points is that we just think of China as this one way of looking at it, that it is strong, that it's aggressive. But picking up on, you know, we know that we have all sorts of domestic problems in the United States to tackle with. There's plenty of domestic problems within China to tackle with. So um, I'm all for, you know, strengthening the United Europe um, viewpoint, but how are we preparing for integrating China in some way or another? How, what kind of a di more differentiated view towards, you know, what's going on in China and how could we, how could we bring that in into our discussions? What are your thoughts on that? Joseph, can we start with you in that question, please? Aggressive. What I'm more afraid of is weak and therefore aggressive. That's Putin. He's aggressive out of weakness to safeguard his domestic power base. Mm -hmm. To 14, uh, 100,000 people were on the road because, you know, Medvedev uh, went down and, and, and he came up again and the Russians weren't happy. So he grabbed a bite of Ukraine and, and you know, Machiavelli would tell you, you have internal problems, pick an external fight. Win it. Don't lose it, because if you lose it, then it's gone. So what I'm more afraid of is, is, is a, a weak China, a weak Xi Jinping who, who is losing control, because he may uh, take a nationalistic issue and go after Taiwan just to consolidate it, his power. So we have to be aware of that. So uh, authoritarian regimes uh, think differently. That's what we tried at DGAP. We We looked at different autocratic states. And what I'm more afraid of is, is, is weak autocrats who don't have anything to lose. So in China, how do we bring that in? I think we, we, we are on the threshold again. We were uh, for those who like history uh, before the worst world war, Germany and uh, Britain. You know, who's the strongest naval power uh, this up and the, and, and if we don't, find back to a modicum of cooperation, if we go full confrontation, we will make a war more likely. Yes, uh, business states can do harm. It's not the Kantian world where uh, trading powers don't do uh, wars because they can lose. We have learned uh, a better lesson with Russia, but that doesn't mean that trading uh, with each other uh, can minimize that conflict. And with China, we go full blast if we decouple, if we take everything out of Taiwan into America. I mean, the war is more likely. And, and think about it. We are here in Germany, and we think that the, the, the rules of the chicken apply for the wild animals. Uh, if you have a confrontative world and not a corporation, you don't have the rule of law. And we are about to see it waning. No WTO, no this, no that. That's a new world. That's a new world of geoeconomics. So the economy is a weapon for geostrategic ends. If we don't get out of that zero-sum logic and find some way, also the US, to mend fences somewhat mid-China, uh, we may end up uh, uh, and, and give Marx uh, uh, a run for his uh, money, yeah. He said, you know, history repeats itself mm. first as a tragedy and then, uh, no, first as a, as a disaster and second as, as a tragedy. I mean, it's, it's an important point to make because if you look at what happened in, in, in Bali and around the G20, I mean, everybody was trying to engage the Chinese leader in conversation for similar reasons. And I think it's a lot of a lot of that work is is clearly risk mitigation, risk prevention. Uh, whether he they took them whether he took them seriously or not, uh, look at the conversation with Prime Minister Trudeau is a different story. But clearly, that's uh, attack that people are following. But yeah, on the on the China piece, I watch. I've been watching Russia for the past years. Yes, uh, my answer will be from this prism, and I can only say that we have to ensure that uh, Xi doesn't fall into the same thinking and trap as Putin has, in the sense that we threatened sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, like severe sanctions, but Putin didn't buy that. He thought we were bluffing, and he in anticipated a weak response. He's now surprised by our, our resolve, and first and foremost, by the Ukrainians' resolve. So we have to ensure that uh, she will, you know, be aware of the severe consequences that would have for his economy, first and foremost, for his army and his people. But this, the key, I would say, to deterring a 
uh, Chinese aggression over Taiwan is again uh, is Russia and Ukraine. So we have to make sure that Putin does not walk away from this with a with a, a mild price. Keeping right now Russia occupies seventeen percent of Ukrainian territories, and only a resounding defeat of Russia would I think deter China from uh, trying to incorporate Taiwan by military means. Rena Kurt. Any 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 no. thoughts on this issue, Kurt? I'll just say that I think that there is zero prospect for Western agreement with Putin uh, in terms of values, in terms of what we are trying to accomplish in the world. There is prospect for Western agreement with China. Now, it's heading the wrong direction, mm. and it may end up worse. But if you look at Chinese society, um, there's checks on Xi. Uh, there is a belief in uh, bringing people out of poverty, in health, in the environment, in technology, in improving people's lives. There's a forward-lookingness in Chinese society. We disagree on individual freedoms and democracy. Uh, therefore, I think there is still some scope for the West and China to find ways to work together and to find ways to accommodate, even if we disagree fundamentally on some big things. Not the case with Russia. We are coming almost to the end of our time together. So I want to look into the audience one more time to see if there are any burning questions, last minute questions of this excellent panel. I said coming into this conversation that the way organizers framed the title of this, we could easily be here for three hours in three different sessions. But I think with this excellent panel, we have managed admirably at touching on all the issues and really creating some, oh, we have one question online. I'm desperate to take somebody from our Zoom room um, because they have been so patiently engaged. So um, if I can, if we can figure out the technology to get you to ask your question live, then we absolutely will do so. Uh, can we hear hello, you? Uh, yes, oh, I can hear you very well, yes. Uh, Thank you, first of all, for the conference. Thank you for this opportunity to attend it online. My name is Lucian Balanuzza. I work as a journalist for Radio Romania Yash, regional public radio in Romania. I'm also an assistant lecturer. My question is, in terms of, of its architecture, of the way it functions, uh, what prevents the EU from playing a greater role at the global stage? What is the best way to, to let's say, to uh, achieve strategic autonomy thank you oh good we've saved the easiest question for last um why can we not get strategic autonomy in europe um Mattia, can we start with you please yeah the french would certainly love that discussion and i can only say that um moments of crisis may enable us to come out uh, stronger as joseph was saying but we have to face the reality that europe as it is set up um is multi-layered and uh, we have um many experienced people here in this room who know this very well so right now we, our model is based on consensus and we have to ask ourselves if we expand the eu to the to ukraine to incorporate ukraine in the western balkans will we have to change some of our architecture and the answer is of course we have to so i hope that we can incorporate new members and change ourselves at the same time and it will uh, require sacrifice or concessions also to the polish who are at the moment um, the most vehement uh, um, opposers or the, the strongest opponents of, a, of removing the veto or the unanimity from a foreign policy. So we have to change our governance. And I would say we have to rethink the institutions, but this crisis hopefully enables us to do that. But on the, on the, in, the, in the reality, um, um, we have even questions about the day-to-day -day business when it comes to foreign debt. If, if you talk to the liberals today, uh, Foreign Minister Lindner today said, absolutely no. So we are far away from where I want us to go. And even um, I would say the, the current uh, common debt issuing is today uh, is not an impossibility, but for Ukraine, I don't see this in the cards for the macro financial assistance that I talked about earlier. So I'm on this issue, I'm skeptical. I'll give you a 30 second response to this. Uh... I need, I need 10. Uh, it's a lack of strategic thinking. We don't have that culture. America has it. Uh, the French still remember it. Uh, the Brits definitely have it. Uh, we don't really understand the crises, the multiple crises that are around us. We think we can go back to business as usual. To understand that, we would need strategic thinkers and structures who would allow that strategic thinking. I, I hope 
uh, those crises will teach us better. Well, we managed to end this round on a semi-optimistic note, not as successful as in the in the full, fulsome discussion, because there is uh, much hope espoused here for better strategic thinking at the heart of Europe. All these four people are engaged in making it so, as am I. I thank you in this room for being with us. I thank you online for joining this discussion. Thank you to my excellent panel. Greatly appreciated. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I know. yes, I'm on. Um, I, my name is Marcus Lippold. I'm one of the uh, board members of United Europe. I'd like to thank the uh, panel for an excellent discussion. I think it's one of the best discussions uh, I've heard, um, not for a long time, but maybe for the very first time in terms of uh, the relationship between uh, EU, Germany the, and the US and the uh, vital role that uh, Ukraine and uh, the ongoing war is playing. I would agree that uh, this is really a uh, defining moment for Europe. Getting this right or not will really change uh, the um, will change Europe and the EU. Thank you very very much for for coming here. Um, every one of you has been absolutely great. You've had a superb moderator. Thank you very very much. Um, thank you for everyone in the room and those uh, online. Don't. Uh, don't be in a rush to leave. We still have some uh, drinks and uh, I think some uh, food for actual food, not for thought, but for the stomach as well. Um, linger and talk a bit more. Uh, it's really been great. It's been a big pleasure. Thank you very, very much. And also to our um, organizing team. We've uh, got uh, Daria and uh, we've got uh, Katarina who desperately try to hide behind the Christmas tree, but they're here. So thank you very much. And there have certainly been enough uh, interesting thoughts to bring forward also on uh, different platforms which are just starting or going on, how to actually do the reconstruction uh, of Ukraine. I'm working uh, on that topic too. So I know um, that... Uh, Court, unfortunately, is right. Um, there's a lot of talk, not much actually going on on the ground yet. Many people grandstanding. In terms of um, common debt, uh, here in Germany, on a, on a bigger stage, um, you'll be admired or hated to whatever reason. So there's there's been a lot of good thoughts. Bring those forward on other platforms and then we will uh, make this a success and uh, definitely Ukraine is an asset. Uh, yes, sometimes you have to pay a bit for an asset, but uh, it's worth it. Thank you very much, everyone. And of course, a big thank you to Vert uh, for hosting us. Um, I should not have forgotten that. Thank you very, very much. Apologies.
you might have said that we started, but the Thank you. 